Well, today is the third <coughs> Sunday after Easter. And we've been back here in Kentucky. The epistle for this third Sunday after Easter. Or uh, after the Mass, there'll be a little, uh, uh, I guess, a little... Potluck row celebration for um, uh, down in the seminary <clears throat> for uh, Reverend Mr. Uh, uh, Sunil. Dr. Sunil is ordained as subdeacon, uh, is uh, so getting close through the holy orders. He should be ordained a priest in a couple of months, and uh, so he was ordained subdeacon. Uh, Lector Exodus Dak Light and subdeacon by Bishop Williamson uh, this last week or two weeks ago, uh, in a week and a half ago in England. And so, after the Mass, so instead of being down at the house, we'll be down at the bottom of the seminary after the Mass today. In the epistle for the third Sunday after Easter is taken from the first epistle of St. Peter, chapter 2. <coughs> Beloved, I exhort you as strangers and pilgrims to abstain from carnal desires which war against the soul. Behave yourselves honorably among the pagans. That whereas they slander you as evildoers, they may, through observing you, by reason of your good works, glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject, therefore, to every human creature for God's sake, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors as sent through him, for, for vengeance upon evildoers, and for the praise of the good. For such is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Live as free men, yet not using your freedom as a cloak for malice, but as servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters in all things, in all fear, not only to the good and to the moderate, but also to the severe. This is indeed a grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then the Gospel. Read that according to St. John, chapter 16. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, a little while and you shall see me no longer. Again, a little while and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Some of the disciples therefore said to one another, What is this that he says to us? A little while and you shall not see me. Again, a little while and you shall see me, and I go to the Father. They kept saying, therefore, What is this little while of which he speaks? We do not know what he is saying. But Jesus knew that they wished to ask him, and he said to them, You inquire about this among yourselves, because I said, a little while and you shall not see me, again a little while and you shall see me. And many men I say to you that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. You shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman about to give birth has sorrow, because her hour has come. But when she has brought forth the child, she no longer remembers the anguish, for it is her joy that a man is born into this world. And you therefore have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice. In your joy, no man shall take from you. That's for the words of today's Holy Gospel. Father, and Father, and Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. St. Ambrose, in the sermon today, speaks about the carnal desires, or the, the works of the, the, the results of the carnal thinking. A few considerations taken from St. Ambrose on this, the considerations of this time after Easter. When our Lord rose from the dead, he says, he came to his apostles right there on Easter Sunday. And when he arrived in the presence of his apostles, they saw him, they knew what he looked like. They knew what he sounded like. Mm -hmm. They knew his teaching. They knew everything about him. They had lived with him intimately for three and a half years. And he rose from the dead, and he appeared before them, and they had a great joy that he was in front of them. But then they did not believe that he was alive. And so there was God in his presence. And St. Ambrose says, God was standing there in the presence of the twelve apostles, the eleven faithful apostles. He was there in the presence of ten of the, of, of, of the twelve apostles, St. Thomas being missing. But he was there with the ten apostles. And they saw him, they listened to him, they were next to him, 
They saw the wounds in his hand. They saw the, the wound in the side. And they were not sure that it was him. And they did not believe. And why is this? And St. Ambrose says, because there are carnal thoughts and there are divine thoughts. And and St. Paul says in the epistle that the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And they will always war against each other. And of course it's obvious when we deal with the temptations of the flesh. That when we know we're being tempted and pulled to anger, being pulled to impurity, and being pulled to the passions, the following of the passions, we can feel very much a physical war between the pulling of the flesh and the pulling of the spirit. And the spirit wants you to stay uh, uh, pure and calm and, and according to the virtues, whichever passion is pulling the soul, but we feel this ripping apart. But the spirit and the flesh do not fight only in the realm of passions. And the spirit of the flesh don't fight only at the lower level. This kind of battle happens even amongst the animals to a certain extent. And the war between the spirit and the flesh is not primarily this pull of the passions towards anger and towards impurity and towards self-gratification in whatever form it comes. It goes deeper than that. The pull of the flesh is to change our minds. The pull of the flesh is to change our very nature, change the way we are, change what we are. Change the way that we look at things. And St. Thomas points out, before Adam sinned, he didn't have the pull of the flesh. Before Adam sinned, he was able to see clearly. He did have infused knowledge, and we don't. But Adam did not only have infused knowledge, he was able to see clearly. He didn't have the pull of the flesh. He could simply look at evidence and see the evidence, and whichever way the evidence leaned, he easily went in that direction. Whichever way it was the truth, he easily grabbed onto it. And he intended towards the truth. And he intended towards the good. He intended towards the beautiful. He intended towards what God had created, which was good and true and beautiful. It was natural for him. But after the original sin, the flesh tainted all those things. And so now the truth is not so easily accepted. And here is a great example, says St. Ambrose. We have ten good apostles. Ten holy apostles. Ten apostles who, even though they have failed Christ through weakness, during those three days of sorrow, their souls are purified by God. And when they saw him on on Easter Sunday morning, they saw Christ and they knew that it was him, but they still were slow to believe. And they had to he had to eat fish. St. Anthony, as we mentioned many times, mentioned in his sermon to the fishes, that this was the greatest glory of the fish. That Christ used the fish to prove definitively by eating fish, because the angels cannot eat, the spirits cannot eat, they cannot do the, the, the physical activities of man of eating. And so therefore, when Christ ate the fish, and they watched him eat the fish, and they saw how his body reacted in the eating of the fish, they knew that he was truly alive, that he was truly flesh, that God was truly in flesh. And one of the great miracles of the supernatural life, and one of the most difficult things for us to do as Catholics and followers of Christ, is to see God in flesh. To see God in flesh. To see God's working in flesh. To see Christ's way in flesh. This is very difficult. And St. Ambrose says, here we are. On the very day of the resurrection, it isn't as though Christ rose from the dead 27 years later. And they all then and you say, yeah, I think I remember you. I, I remember what you did. Yeah, you look very familiar to me. He rose from the dead three days later. In fact, it was 36 hours on the third day. It wasn't even three complete days. He had just died on Friday afternoon, and now they see him on Sunday afternoon. It has only been a few hours. And they see him on this third day, and it is so clear that it's him, but they still cannot believe. And this is the mystery of the real war between the flesh and the spirit. Therefore, why is it that God made his church? He made his church with men in it. St. Gregory the Great says also, or St. Jerome rather, says in one of his sermons about the shepherds, he says, why did God choose shepherds to announce his birth? Why did he choose fishermen to announce his death? He chose shepherds to announce his birth. Because 
They are outside the city, and they are ordinary low men, weak flesh. And he wanted, if those who have faith will be able to see through the flesh of these weak shepherds and find Christ. And those who do not have the faith will not be able to see through. And he chose fishermen. Fishermen are the, are the lower caste. Fishermen are towards the bottom. They're not the very bottom, but they're towards the bottom. And they're ordinary workers. They, have the, they, 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 they are not uh, the, the, the greatest of men. And for the same reason he chose fishermen to announce his kingdom. And so a priest is a fisherman, and a priest is a shepherd. A fisherman sails in the sea, and the shepherdman works out in the fields. And one of the elements that they both have in common is that they're homeless in their work. The fishermen are in the sea, and the shepherd is in the field, and they are not working in the home. And one reason why God made this fishermen and shepherds to be the carriers of his kingdom is because their home should not be this earth. Their home is supposed to be in heaven. And they're supposed to be pointing towards another home. But we have a deep problem. How do we find God in flesh? How do we find truth in flesh? How do we find grace in flesh? Because the closer and closer we get to the flesh, the closer and closer we get to men, the more we discover how bad things are. Like for instance, one of the discoveries of religious life, and one of the mysteries of religious life, in the outside world, there's gossip. And in the outside world, there is backbiting. And in the outside world, there is talking one against another. In the outside world, there is hateful speech. But that's little kid stuff compared to what happens amongst priests. <laughs> and that's nothing compared to what happens in monasteries. That's nothing compared to what happens in convents. It is so much uglier, so much deeper, so much harder. If you get a sense of it, a good book to read is... Mother Marianas, the admirable life of Mother Mariana, where when she was taking care of a sick sister, when she was near death, she saved up spit when she was near death so that she could spit in the face of Mother Mariana while the only one that would take care of her. And she carried hate almost to the grave until Mother Mariana offered up all her sacrifices that this sister, El Capitana, might convert and repent. And so how do we find God in flesh? The flesh wars against the spirit. And the obvious war is the outside war. The one that we can see. The fighting against temptations against purity. The fighting against temptations of anger. All these external temptations. This is the outside of the spiritual life. This is the outside of the faith. That's the windows. That's the outside. Uh, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 the siding on the outside. The roof. The exterior part of the spiritual life. And there may be many holes in the, spirit, in the exterior part. If you go to Daravi in Bombay, the largest slum in the world, you go inside of that slum, and you can go inside of that slum not far from the Bombay airport, and you'll find many places in which there are plastic tarps on the roof, and metal sheet metal laying on the roof, and all kinds of holes. And when you walk inside, they have Porsches, and they have Lamborghinis, and they have the largest TVs known to man and the best surround system, sound system there is, and marble and marble floors and the most expensive houses you can find. So don't judge a burp by its cover in India. And the fact is that sometimes the outside is the other way around and it looks very beautiful. And yet it is repugnant on the inside. And though the outside can be a sign of what happens inside the soul, it does not tell us really the state of the soul because there's something mysterious going on inside the soul. There are many souls that have great weakness of flesh and yet their mind and heart are warned against the spirit though their body fights. There are others, such as the five foolish virgins, who have won the battle on the outside and they're no longer having problems with the temptations of the flesh directly. You know that one of the signs, and this is a very dangerous sign, if the devil is leaving you alone in temptations, and the temptations have all gone away, and yet we find a darkness in the soul, and yet we find a certain kind of unhappiness, and yet we find a certain bitterness, these are signs that the soul is in the hand of Satan. These are signs that the devil is slowly encroaching on the soul. Because remember, the external battle is a means to get to the inside. 
The external battle is a step. And if the devil is controlled on the inside, and if he rules on the inside, like St. Augustine says about the five foolish virgins, the five foolish virgins, they are not sinning against the flesh. They are virgins. They are not sinning in, in, in the external ways, at least visibly. They're not sinning against the flesh, certainly, and they're not finished, visibly sinning in other external ways. They're good people. And the five foolish virgins end up in hell. And why do they end up in hell? Because they did not carry lamp, a lantern. They didn't carry enough oil. And that oil signifies two things. Two things that can never be removed in the supernatural life. Never. Charity and prayer. The oil of charity. The oil is used in the curing of the sick and the taking care of the neighbor. And prayer. It can never ever be taken away from our lives. And the prayer slowly goes out from our lives. And we replace it with other things. And then St. Ambrose, going back to St. Ambrose's uh, sermon of today, he says that man is, uh, believes only according to carnal experience. We only believe according to carnal experience. We believe what we experience. He says, yet, look at the situation. St. Ambrose gives a very simple example. He says, what is a greater miracle? To raise someone from death to life, who was alive before and then died, or to take someone from nothing to life. It is clearly a greater miracle to bring someone from nothing to life than it is to go from death back to life. And we see every day millions of babies being born. Millions of babies are being born. And St. Ambrose says the birth of a baby is a greater miracle than the resurrection of the dead. But because we see this miracle all the time, we are not impressed by the miracle. One of the reasons why Satan tries to wipe out human flesh, one reason why he tries to wipe out birth, he hates, he hates life. One reason he hates it is because he, no angel, can ever give life. Only men can. It is a power that God gave to man that he never gave to the angels. And this power to give life, the Satan is very envious of that power and very angry about that power. And therefore, amongst many other reasons, he wants to kill the babies. And so, they're, they're, that this is a miracle that God performs every time a child is conceived. And this miracle is a greater power. A greater miracle, says St. Ambrose, than to rise from the dead. And so there is God. God who made birth. God who made conception. God who made children. God who made the, the stars. And, and St. Gregory, I believe it is, gives the other example. That's a greater miracle for an acorn to turn into an oak. Or a grain of wheat to turn into a, a, a wheat. A, a, a blade of wheat than it is for the miracle of the stopping of the waves of the sea. And we see these greater miracles every day, but we do not believe. Because of the weakness of our flesh, God gave us the outside world in order to remind us of his power every day. And we have to learn to see God in flesh. And this is the battle of the supernatural life. This is the battle. How is it that God can be inside of this weak sinner? How is it that God can be inside of that weak sinner? How is it that God can be in this place? How is it that God can be in that place? St. Ambrose says today, here is God, perfect, standing in the upper room, after being dead for only three days. And they see him, and they touch him, and they hear him, and they have all the evidence but they are still slow to believe. How can the church spread throughout the world by human flesh? For 2,000 years, there have been weak priests and weak bishops and weak Catholics, all bad examples, all weak in the flesh, or the majority of them. And yet the church has grown, and yet the faith has remained inside of this world for 2,000 years. Even now, in the great crisis of the church, there are still souls that have the faith, and why is it? Only because of the direct, miraculous intervention of the grace of God, which cannot be stopped. That's the reason. The grace of God. The grace of God and the supernatural power of the grace of God cannot be stopped. One of the grave problems in the church today, especially in Catholic tradition, particularly amongst St. Vicardus and also amongst some uh, of the Catholics of the of tradition who are not, not following the era of Sede Vicantism 
is that they say the truth is obvious. Anybody can know it. Everybody can know that the Pope is a heretic. Everyone can know that, that the Vatican II is evil. Everyone can know that the bishop is going against God and that he is lying about the faith when he teaches all the modernism comes from Vatican II. Everyone that can know that Bishop Filet is lying. Everyone can know that, that the, the society has changed from the way of Archbishop Lefebvre to the present side. Even though all the material evidence is there, we're forgetting something. It's true that all the material evidence is there. We've got it in writing. Vatican II enlightens and deepens the faith. we got it in writing. The new mass is legitimate, legitimately promulgated, which is even worse than saying that it's legitimate. So with even the strongest language, it's legitimately promulgated. A true law of the church. We accept all of the new teachings. Even though these things are black and white true. Yes, they are black and white true. But who is the one looking at it? Who is the one reading it? And from what, con what background do they come? They come from the background of weak flesh and the habit of seeing all things through carnal experience, as St. Ambrose says. We think too much through carnal experience. And this is why, for instance, for the devil, the TV, one of the many, many reasons why the TV is so important. The TV teaches you carnal thinking. The TV teaches you how to not think like Christ, how to not think like a Catholic, how to not see God in things, but rather to see man in things and have a great desire for material things and to think like the experts. If you just watch garbage movies, and cartoons and other stupid things, it will do some harm to your soul. But in fact, what does greater harm is PBS and CNN and Fox News and the, uh, the History Channel, in which a man with a nice suit and with a great deal of believability and intelligence forms your mind to think like a Mason, forms your mind to think like a modernist, forms your mind to think like a heretic of one type or another, and to bring your, your mind into a new kind of thinking, which is not the thinking of Christ. We know the grace of God is more powerful than human flesh. And the flesh does war against the spirit. But it does not only war against the spirit in the battle of impurity versus purity and anger versus calmness of soul. It battles in the air between truth and lies. A man hears what he wants to hear. A man believes what he wants to believe. And what he wants to believe is based on his flesh. Does he war against the flesh? Does he try to follow the way of the Spirit? You know, the grace of God happens every time when we go to confession, when we go to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. In the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, a weak a human being who is a priest of God maintains his weakness, maintains his difficulties, maintains his problems. And yet at the same time, when he says, this is my body, hocus enum corpus meum, God is truly made presence and he always comes every time. And when he says, ego te observo apocatis tuis, God comes every time. And when he blesses a rosary, God blesses it. And when he does the work of God, it is done. And how is that possible? It is not possible except for the presence of the divine grace and the power of the Holy Mother of the Church and the power of the angels. We must recognize in our church that there is no good that does not come from God. There is no increase that doesn't come from God. And we must learn to try to see the grace of God in all things. Remember what St. Paul says, All things are unto good to those that are of the household of the faith. That's easy to believe when it's good things. But how is it that when it's bad things and wicked things and difficult things? All of us struggle with this. We all struggle. Why is God allowing this? Why is God allowing that? And can we struggle? David tells us in the Psalms we read every week in the Holy Breviary, O oh Lord, how long? How long will thou forsake me? How long will this go on? And so David, the great heart of the Catholic Church, King David, cries in his heart, O oh Lord, how long? Even Job begged to understand. So, and our Lord himself, to make, it, make, it, make us understand that we can cry and say, Lord, please help me, I do not understand. When he himself said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me, but not my will, but thine be done. And so, 
we will experience many trials and many tribulations and many difficulties. And what God asks of us, can you still have the faith? Can you still see through all the smoke? Can you still see Christ at work? Can you still see the divine grace operating? The world is getting worse every day, every month, every year. Despite what Bishop Follet says, it's getting worse. And what are we to do? When the world gets worse, what are we to do? See the victory of Christ, the victory of Mary. And how does this work out in the battle? When we are fighting inside of our own souls, where is our soul relationship to God? We do not know. If you got mad seven times last week, whereas two weeks ago you got mad 75 times, it doesn't mean you become a more calm person. It doesn't mean that at all. And if it goes the other way around, it doesn't mean you became a more angry person. It may be you just had 75 occasions two weeks ago and seven this week. Therefore, you got mad that many times. God knows what's in the heart. God knows what's in the soul. We must continue to fight. But don't look too much. We always talk about the examination of conscience. We must examine our conscience. We don't directly examine the state of our souls directly. Because only God sees that soul directly. We say, Lord, I am sorry for all the offenses that I have made against you. And I don't want to make them anymore. But I do not know where my heart stands. Make my heart to increase. Remember the wise words of St. Joan of Arc. When wicked priests tried to trap a 19-year-old girl who didn't know how to read. And they asked her, are you in the state of grace? And if she said yes, they would say, aha, you are proud and presumptuous. And therefore you are you're going to be condemned. If she said no, then they would say to her, Ah, you're admitting that you didn't hear the voices of St. Michael and the others, and you're a liar, and you must re repent. So yes was the wrong answer, and no was the wrong answer. And the 19-year-old girl that couldn't read, the wise priest said to her, Are you in the state of grace? And she said, If I am, not, if I, am I pray God keep me there, and if I am not, I pray he put me there. And this is the prayer that we must have. Are we really pleasing to God? Are we really climbing in the supernatural life? Can we count by the number of external battles that we won against the flesh? Can we count by the number of external battles that we were lost against the flesh? We must always continue to fight, but we cannot count. Only God knows what's inside the heart. And he doesn't want us to know directly. And that is why he says, let a man take heed lest he fall. We must not be that we are secure. And remember the only secure man he spoke of is, there was a man who was secure because he had a sword and because he had his possessions. But if a man is stronger than he comes, he will take away what he has. And that is what will happen. If we are strong and we are secure, a stronger one will come and take away what we have. Therefore the wise thing is to be insecure and weak. And the wise thing is to remember the word of the holy publican who came into the back of the church. O oh Lord, merciful be to a sinner. It is amazing how that prayer, the only one that Christ says we must say when we come into a church. The other prayers are optional, but that one's necessary. And it still happens that as we come inside of the church and come inside of the house of God, what do we do? We see the evil of the others. We see the evil of everything around us. But we do not see our own selves. O oh Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. This is what Christ demands of us. And so the, floor, the flesh does war against the spirit. But the flesh does not war against the spirit only in the external realm of the battle of impurity and the battle of anger. It realms more importantly in the interior. And that's the great battle. And the challenge of that battle is we don't see it so clearly. And also our Lord knows the workings of his grace. And remember, all of his grace, all of his grace passes through the hands of Mary. There isn't a drop of grace that doesn't go through her hands. There isn't one. Now how could it be that the Blessed Virgin Mary, who all grace that's in our holy church, all these wicked bishops, all these wicked cardinals, all these wicked priests, besides the very weak ones that are cowards, and the other ones that don't even care, and these, these bishops and these priests of the church, can they be converted? Can they be brought back to God? It takes only the lifting of her little finger. With her heel, she crushes the head of the serpent. 
it doesn't take much effort. How much effort does it take to convert the soul of man? She can move her finger, she can move her hands, and she can change the souls of men. And she has made a little condition, that consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And that condition will one day be fulfilled. And we wait for that condition to be fulfilled. But between now and that day, what are we to do? Continue to war against the flesh. Continue to fight on behalf of the Spirit. And continue to ask the grace of God, a greater charity and a greater faith, to grow inside of our hearts and inside of our souls. And we'll pray for that. And God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.